So welcome everyone. It's nice to see you all joining us today in one, um, one more of our CGU seminar every Friday. We are here together and today we are delighted to have with us Dr. Amanda Alvarenga. Amanda Alvarenga has recently completed her PhD degree at the University of Purdue under the supervision of Dr. Luis Brito. Her research was focused on quantitative genetics and genomics, and the field topics included data simulation to evaluate single steps genomic prediction approaches in crossbred populations, a systematic review of genes controlling behavioral indicators in livestock species and humans, evaluation of behavior um, in American Angus calves, behavior as a longitudinal trait in American Angus dams, and um, evaluation of an across-country evaluation for American and Australian Angus populations. So Amanda has recently started a position as a data scientist focused on plant breeding at Corteva AgriScience in the USA, where she will partner with plant breeders to drive analytical genetic gains. So thank you again, Amanda, for joining us, and I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan, for the introduction and also for the invitation. So for today, actually, I selected a few results of a two parallel projects that I was uh, working on during my PhD, which involves temperament and food score traits in Angus cattle. So I tried to avoid to make a very long introduction. So I brought here just the two, um, two slides and one that I like the most that excited me working on those projects because the traits that we were working on doesn't have just an interest for academia to understand better the genetic architecture of those traits. But actually, North American and Australia Angus farmers were also interested on temperament and structural problems. Here it is just a table from a survey taken by North American and Australia Angus uh, farmers in which they rank both temperament and a food score within the top three traits desired for selection. So, and this is um, clearly due to the correlation of those traits with economically important traits that is of interest for the industry. But another caveat for these traits are that they are correlated with animal welfare that is a concern for consumers, for example. And I think that animal welfare is a very complex trait because if we think um, at the five freedom as an approach to assess animal welfare, we are, I think all of us are going to think about many uh, indicator traits that can measure animal welfare. And in this case, I would like to give a focus on temperament, which is uh, indicator of animal wealth on animal behavior and the food scores that is directly linked with the discomfort and the pain uh, of animals. So when we think about how we can improve temperament and in this case food score, it is not an easy task because there are multiple factors controlling the phenotypic variability of both the traits. And here I'm going to list a few uh, general topics that can control the variation of the, the phenotype for both the traits that we had encountered in our data set, such as the life stage of the individual. And one good example is temperament. If we take a look on temperament on calves around one year old versus temperament on dams, even though it is the same metric, probably the biological process being captured by, by, by that temperament measured on calves is probably different of the biological process being captured by temperament measured on them. So for instance, on the calf, the mechanisms being captured can be fear, versus on the dam can be that maternal ability of protecting its calf. 
So another point it is regarding facilities and environmental conditions. In food score, for example, it is clear to see variations on the expression of the phenotype when we look on uh, animals raised in pasture versus feedlot. And even within feedlot, the diet can also impact um, um, the phenotypic variability of food scores. And then there is management, and there are many studies on the literature, in this case, um, experimentally designed, evaluating the impact of the frequency and the quality of a human and animal interaction on animal behavior. But even within the same contemporary group, all animals managed the same way, we can see variation among them, and that this can be due to genetics and genotype by environment interaction. So in this presentation specifically, I try to target few of those factors and I try to understand better what is happening. So just to give you an expectation of what I wanted to highlight in this presentation, I have two general objectives. The first one um, that is to evaluate the changes in temperament at the different life states of Angus cattle, and for that we use the longitudinal data. And the second objective is to evaluate the genotype by environment interaction for food scores. So just to give one overview of the second topic, we, we did many research on top of that. We tried to evaluate the genotype by environment interaction within country, for example, taking into account levels of environment gradients, as well as a comparing ecoregions. But in this presentation specifically, I would like to give a focus on genotype by environment interaction across countries. So in this case would be United States and Australia. So going to the first uh, part of this presentation, this uh, was a project in collaboration with Angus Genetics Incorporation from American Angus Association. And this uh, chapter is under review at the G in the GSC, and the title of the manuscript is Unrevealing the Phenotypic and the Genomic Background of a Behavioral Plasticity and the Temperament in North America Angus Cattle. And the two main questions of this research are, is temperament recorded at a different age genetically correlated? And uh, if there is a variation, a change of temperament over time, is there, an, is there any additional information provided by this longitudinal measurement? So to answer uh, those questions, we, are, we focused in one uh, data set that was temperament recorded on the dam when its calf was weaned. And therefore, we could have repeated records of a temperament on a data dam. That depends on the manufacturers, right? If that dam is having a yearly calf, or if the farmer recorded that data, or if the dam is still in the farm. And here is just an idea of the data distribution that we had. We had the records collected on dams around the two years old that were the majority of our records. And as the age of the animal goes on until 15 years old, the amount of records decrease. So this study, the metric that we used was temperament, which is an indicator trait for behavior. And this trait was subjectively measured by the farmers using a scoring system provided by American Angus Association. So in this case, it's a little bit different. Like I think the scale is inverse compared to dairy cattle, right? In your case for beef cattle, score one is a docile animal and score six is a very aggressive animal. And here I presented the distribution of those records when we compare two types of data set. Temperament, the same metric, measured on calves around one year old that can be male and female 
versus um, temperament measured on the cows, on the dams. And we can see a shift on the distribution of the records. But the focus on this presentation is on cow at weaning temperament. And after quality control, we had 154,000 records uh, for cow at weaning temperament. And these records um, are from multiple years, as well as uh, recorded across um, the United States. It is not just from one or a few farms. Actually, it's a, a much broader data set. And out of those cows, around 9,000 had actually genotyped information, but the majority of them had actually the pedigree information that we are going to combine. So to answer the questions of this study, the first thought that came into our minds is to perform a, a multi-trait analysis in which we group the records in days into age groups that had an interval of one year one year um, old. So in for further analysis, we are not working with days anymore. We are going to be working with age groups that has like animals recorded up to three years old, up to four years old, and so on. So in total, we had nine age groups. But we thought that we could take more advantage of the data and evaluate not, not just the compare age groups, but evaluate the trajectory of a temperament over time. So this was the reason why we chose to use random regression. And here was the model used. And we used the first order Legendre polynomial due to few reasons. And one of them, it was the that is structure that wouldn't allow to fit higher order due to the amount of repeated records records that we had. And for those that doesn't um, haven't worked with random regression yet, I just brought here an idea what would be the outcomes from a random regression uh, and what we can do with that. So the direct outcome from our random regression is going to be variance components, breeding values, or SNP effects for the coefficients that we are feeding. In my case, it is the first order. Therefore, I have intercept and slope. So I would have heritability and correlations for the intercept and the slope, breeding values for each individual for the intercept and the slope, and therefore I could evaluate the trajectory. Um, but from this outcome, we can back solve that to obtain results similar to a multivariate analysis. So therefore, we could have heritabilities and correlations among those age groups. So this is what I'm showing here. So and from the second group of results that we can get from the random regression, I try to answer the first question that is, is temperament recorded at um, different age uh, high, uh, genetically correlated? So this is the first part, first results of this study in which we calculated the genetic correlations or any correlations across each age group. So on this figure, on the lower diagonal are actually the genetic correlations and upper diagonal is the standard arrow between parentheses. And we can see that even when we compare records collected at um, age far apart, for example, three years old and a 10 years old, they are highly correlated, which suggests that the temperament across the years can be considered as the same trait and probably the same dream genes are controlling the expression of that trait. However, when we look at the phenotypic correlation per se, the scenario is a little bit different, and I think we would expect that because the environment plays an important role on the variation, overall variation of temperament. And I just said to give an extra support, I correlate the yearling temperament, that is that the temperament measured on females and males at one year old with the cow temperament, 
we can observe a high genetic correlation, but it is still um, a magnitude is a little bit lower compared to within the measurement cow at weaning temperament. And uh, secondly, we observe similar pattern for the phenotypic variation, uh, phenotypic correlation, I'm sorry. So, but from this phenotypic correlation, we had uh, the following thought, okay, temperament across the years is highly correlated, but even though probably there is some variation across the years, and from that, we try to evaluate the change of temperament over time, so the trajectory of temperament over time, and see if we can find a novel trait associated to that that is uh, genetically controlled. So from this result, instead of looking at each time point, we are going to be looking at the trajectory of temperament over time. So we are interested now at this change of temperament over time, the genetic change over time, that is going to be um, is going to be using actually the coefficients from um, the variance components. That in this case we are going to give a special focus on the slope that we term that as learning and behavioral plasticity. So when we look at the heritability of the actually learning and behavioral plasticity that is this change over time it is lowly heritable compared to the overall temperament cowet winning temperament which has a heritability of 0.4 on um, liability scale so this heritability is very low and we are aware of that but even though presenting a low heritability, there is a genetic component attributed to that. And from this genetic component, we can distinguish some animals with different patterns of learning and behavioral plasticity, as I'm going to show on the next slide. So here it is just to give an idea um, what that learning and a behavioral plasticity at the genetic level can mean. So I selected the nine bulls with different patterns, and those bulls were actually highly accurate. Um, the the, um, the uh, genomic breeding values for the intercept and the slope were highly accurate because they had many daughters re with repeated records. So on the y-axis, we actually had the probability of the animal being docile. So we can consider that the three top sires, they have a desired learning and a behavioral plasticity, what we call habituation, because the animals are getting more docile over the years. On the other side, like on the opposite side, the bottom three sires had undesirable learning and behavioral plasticity, what we call sensitization, because the animals are getting more aggressive, the probability of the animals uh, across the years, the animal has a probability of being more aggressive compared to other individuals. So, um, and from that, I just wanted that you present a few other um, uh, comparisons is I selected the daughters of this navy blue and I plotted here what would be their genetic control. But the majority of those daughters were also raised in the same contemporary group, what I'm showing here. So we have contemporary group C, contemporary group D, and a contemporary group E. And within that, we had half siblings that were from this bull. So first, we can observe that the environment can have a different impact on the probability of the animal being docile or aggressive, such as the in this management condition E actually had a more positive influence on the probability of the animal being docile compared to these other two management conditions. And the second point that I wanted to highlight is, even though we think contemporary group, 
animals being managed in the same way, individuals can have a different response to that in, uh, to that environment. And this range to that this term that we wanted to um, uh, bring that is the learning and the behavior plasticity. So even though the animals were raised in the same condition, we can still observe variations that is due to genetic and it can also be due to this learning and behavioral plasticity um, uh, component. So another uh, part that we did, we had GWAS for each time point, but we also have the GWAS for the overall temperament, that is the intercept, and the learning and the behavioral plasticity, that is the slope. First, we observed the similar um, candidate regions across between those two terms and kind of it was expected because the correlation between the overall temperament and the learning and the behavioral plasticity was high that the genetic correlation was equal to 0.74 but one uh, point that intrigued us and um, we were kind of excited about was that there were some regions that were uniquely uh, suggested for learning and behavioral plasticity. And uh, those genes located on those regions had been previously associated in studies in mice and in humans associated with development delayed, impaired learning and behavioral plasticity. And here are three examples of those genes. So um, here is just like a few takeaways from this study. The first one is that the temperament is highly genetically correlated across the years, and that suggests that we can select individuals based on their breeding values earlier in life, because probably it is going to represent well um, um, the temperament GBV later in life. However, the phenotypic correlation decreases as the gap in years increases, and from that we try to evaluate the changes of temperament over time. And we observed that the term that we call learning and behavioral plasticity, the slope. Um, even though in this study we and I think it is similar with a study also done in chickens that uh, we observe a very small heritability attributed to this component. But again, um, I think that uh, is still a lot of research should continue to be done on top of this component. And one reason for that is the data structure that we had probably couldn't be optimal to capture um, a higher uh, genetic variance for this component. So I think the point here that I wanted to bring up and um, we also like discuss um, in our study is that we should encourage farmers to keep recording those measurements over time and as much data coming in, we can probably more powerfully estimate those various components and hopefully this uh, irritability can increase and that therefore we can start thinking about it to select animals based on uh, this learning and a behavioral plasticity. And we also observe some genes, candidate genes actually, that um, associated to this behavioral plasticity that had been previously associated with some uh, development delayed um, in mice and humans. And um, but you probably are asking yourself why this component learning and behavioral plasticity would it be important. Well, if you think about with the emerging technologies um, such as virtual fans or um, robots, it would be beneficial to select animals that could quickly and easily habituate to change environments and therefore learn with the new environment as well as keep up with the production. This, is, this was actually the main idea from this learning and behavioral plasticity. 
So, and now I just wanted to quickly show a few results from the second project that we also worked with, that is now with the food score, and we are combining data from two countries. And uh, an additional justification for this study was that uh, in 2019, America Angus Association and Angus Australia decided to partner to perform a joint genomic evaluation for food score. And in this case, it's not a maize evaluation because we actually are combining raw phenotypic and genomic data. So, but from this study, before uh, suggesting a final model, we had a few questions. And the first one is, are North American and Australia Angus cattle pop the same population at the genomic level? So evaluate if there is the same um, segregation pattern between them. And if they are, there is a genotype by environment interaction between US and Australia for the trade food score because uh, we know that even though we are comparing the same population, different traits can have uh, different levels of GBI. So why that it is also important to evaluate for all traits. And finally, we wanted to test many models and suggest suggest the one model that would outperform for a genomic prediction across countries. So for this study, the food score is uh, measured using two metrics. Foot angle, that is the angle made between the foot and the ground, which ideally would be 45 degrees, and it is represented as the score 5. And the claw set, how the claws are placed and spaced, and ideally should be symmetrical, as represented by the score 5. Both the US and Australia has the same scoring system. But in this presentation, in this study specifically, I just use the records from 5 through 9, uh, due to few reasons that later, if you're interested, we can discuss on them. Um, and um, for this analysis, we had 51,000 records for US and 72,000 for Australia. This using um, after quality control. Out of those animals with phenotypic records, 32,000 and 22,000 had phenotype and a genotype. But the ultimate goal of this study was actually to recommend a model to be implemented in a weekly genetic evaluation. So for that, we use the whole genomic data set available, mimicking what would happen in a weekly genetic evaluation. So this study had four groups of analysis. The first one was a population characterization, but in this presentation, I'm going just to show the consistency of gametic phase and the principal component analysis. We, um, using covariance components between countries, uh, the genetic correlation between countries, we can measure genotype by environment interaction. We tested a few models for genomic prediction and we performed GWAS specific for each country. So here I'm quickly showing the genomic scenarios that we tested. As I said, the ultimate goal it is to find a model that would fit it better, that would um, perform better in a weekly genetic evaluation. And because of that, and to be fair, we fixed or genotype and a pedigree data set. So all the scenarios tested had the same genotype and pedigree data sets. And what is changing across scenario is our phenotypic estimation set. So we have mimicking here a within country evaluation in which we are just adding a phenotype from US and a phenotype from Australia. And then we have two additional scenarios testing a joint genomic evaluation. The first scenario is considering US and Australia as two different populations, therefore two different traits. And the fourth scenario here, it is considering US and Australia as the same population. Therefore, instead of having two GBVs for each animal, 
for different country, we are going to have a one GBV that is applicable for all countries. So we just combine their data. And ideally, this would be the optimal scenario in terms of um, speed of analysis. And also, um, it is more convenient because we have just one breeding value. So we use the forward validation using um, linear regression method. And our validation group were uh, animals born after 2019. So we had the whole genomic, uh, the whole data genomic analysis in which we had the true breeding value between quotation, right? And at the end, we had a second analysis with the partial data set in which the phenotype from the validation animals are masked, and we compare those two predictions. And the three metrics that we used were bias, dispersion, and accuracy. So, and here comes the results. So for the first question that I had at the beginning was, is US and Australia the same population at the genomic level? And our answer is yes, because considering the consistency of gametic phase, even though when we correlate the magnitude and the direction of SNPs, far apart between the two populations, the correlation is high. So we can see high genetic correlation, suggesting that both US and Australia probably has similar uh, gametic phasing. And on the principal component analysis, they also cluster together. I know that since that has a segregation and a deal like between Australia and US, they are not randomly a cluster, but this is due to also like different uh, sires or genetic groups being used. However, there is a high overlap between those individuals because if I zoom in here, we are going to see a lot of like animals from Australia in this side and vice versa. So based on the many, um, analysis that we did, we could consider US and Australia as the same population at the genomic level. So from this, we move now to the analysis in which we take into account the genomic information. And the first, the second question was, is there any genotype by environment interaction between countries for food score? And in the literature, we have the threshold, the pre pre-established that if the correlation is lower than uh, 0.7 or 0.8, it suggests that there is genotype by environment interaction. So the correlation that we observed between US and Australia was uh, lower than 0.8, so it uh, had a um, um, genetic correlation of a 0.61 and a 0.76, suggesting that probably there is some genotype by environment interaction, therefore some re-ranking of sires across country. However, I think that that genetic correlation, it is not just explained by genotype by environment interaction. The genetic correlation, a different of one, could also be explained by some artifacts of the data, such as the genetic correlation that we estimate is just based on pedigree. And when we look at the pedigree, the length of the pedigree, there is 9% of sires um, overlapping between countries that are from US and Australia. So the question that we had was, if we increase the connection, the relationship between individuals using genomic, would that genetic correlation increase? Because using genomic, we would kind of maximize the share of information between countries. And yes, at some extent, we increase the genetic correlation, however, this, genet this genomic correlation didn't achieve uh, point, um, one, one um, still. So what I wanted to say here is 
that the genetic correlation using pedigree, some extent of that difference from one can in, uh, can be explained by delay um, by pedigrees that are not well um, connected. So if we include Include the genomic information, we are going to um, increase by um, some extent that the genetic correlation. But in addition to that, another point is the differences in data recording. And there are other layers that I wanted to discuss, but I just bring one. In, um, in Australia, food score is recorded by a technician while in the United States, the food score is recorded by farmers. So could these differences in recording also uh, be responsible for that genetic correlation lower than one? So to evaluate that recently, uh, um, Australia started allowing farmers to also record uh, food score. Therefore, in the data set, from Australia, there is about 3% of records that is collected by farmers and 97% is collected by technician. So what we did, we correlate uh, records from farmers and records from um, um, technician and that this correlation was different of one. It was pretty high, that is a good sign. So. Farmers are doing a good job of recording the food score. That is a good indication because we can in, um, encourage farmers to record and therefore we can have more data because um, uh, technician recording traits cost money, right? So, but again, another um, shrink of that genetic correlation could be at some extent also explained by uh, dif differences in data recording. So, and the three, um, the second last part of this study was genomic prediction, in which we had within country evaluation and considering a joint genomic evaluation. Green and orange is within country evaluation, and in purple and pink it is a joint genomic evaluation. We can clearly see again performing a joint genomic evaluation and kind of in this case it is obvious because we are adding more information and in addition to the improvement in predictive ability, a joint genomic information has many other benefits such as exchange of genetic material, and one point that I wanted to highlight here is when we compare a model that takes into account the genetic correlation, genotype by environment interaction in purple, versus a model that we are disregarding genotype by environment interaction, we are considering that US and Australia has a correl genetic correlation equal to one, they perform equally. And even when we compare the ranking of sires, between those two models, they are very correlated. And the same thing happened for class set. So, and the last part of this study was uh, the GWAS. And uh, first, we, in, in the rows here, we had the GWAS for US and the GWAS from Australia. And what we can observe is similar regions being significantly associated with the traits. That again goes in line with the, um, the correlation, that, even though the correlation was different of one, the correlation between them was high. So, um, and one interesting part was that the significant genes, significant regions, associated with the foot score, foot angle, and a claw set had been previously associated with bone structure or uh, bone, um, a bone development in humans and mice. So just some takeaways from this study is, first, we didn't see clear uh, stratification between US and Australia Angus population. 
Second, we observe some level of genotype by environment interaction for food score between those countries. However, uh, uh, some magnitude of though this genotype by environment interaction can be attributed by artifacts of the data, such as data recording. Um, third point, a joint genomic prediction outperformed a within country evaluation, and this was what we would expect because we are adding more phenotypic information, and especially when we compare food score versus weight or um, weight gain, for example, food score we had we have much less inform phenotypic information, so combining data would aggregate would create a much a more powerful estimation set. And in addition to all the benefits that a joint prediction would have, because then we can, uh, farmers could select sires from different countries with much more confidence. And um, yes. Um, and the last point is that disregarding genotype by environment interaction in the prediction provided the similar results when we account for genotype by environment interaction. And again, as I said in the material methods, the single trait model considering US and Australia as the single trait has many advantages in terms of uh, considering that weekly a genetic evaluation is performed. So if we could save time and save memory, um, it is a gain. So um, the single trait um, considering US and Australia as the same trait, it is beneficial. So with that, I just wanted that you bring um, the final considerations from this presentation. And the first one is that the temperament measured at the different life states and aids are genetically correlated. However, when we have a repeated records on the temperament, we can extract uh, an additional component that I think for the future, um, it would be um, an important component, which is learning and a behavioral plasticity. And it would serve as an additional tool to select individuals um, to improve the animal welfare, as well as to improve the habituation of those individuals to challenging environments or to the emerging technologies. And lastly, um, there was a genotype by environment interaction observed for food scores between US and Angus Australia. However, uh, that level of genotype by environment interaction, in my um, interpretation is that it wasn't significant enough in order to the genotype, to the model accounting for genotype by environment interaction interaction outperform a model that we don't account for that. So at the end in this study, my recommend our recommendation was to use um, a model that didn't account for genotype by environment interaction, at least for now. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and listening to me. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions or suggestions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. That was very well presented. And now uh, I would like to open to the audience as Amanda just uh, invited us to interact with questions or comments. So please raise your hand. I see already Christine Bays, you have your hand raised here. So please go ahead. Hello, thank you for such a nice presentation. It's nice to see that uh, Louise is teaching you all the right things. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I have a question about your your conclusion or conclusion, your sort of statement that the populations are are the same. Uh, the with regards to your first study, the um, the Australian Angus and the American Angus. Mm -hmm. So. I thought it was really interesting because when you estimated the heritabilities for claw, I think mm -hmm. those heritabilities were were 
were not quite the same. There was there was a pretty good difference between there. So does that does that support or not support your your sort of statement that they're the same population? Yeah, that's a uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think it is an interesting point. Um, my conclusion wasn't to draw just based on one analysis. What I wanted to just say, what I presented here for the population structure are just two of the few analyses that we did. We also perform a mixture analysis. So my conclusion was to draw based on like a holistic view of the whole um, the whole data set. I agree in terms of a variance components, when we compare the variance components estimated within US and within Australia, they are slightly different. They are not the same, but I don't think that they are um, significantly different either because on the variance components per se, not like looking at the irritability, but the variance components per se, the um, confidence interval, they overlapped or they are uh, very close. And one uh, observation is we would expect that the variance components would be slightly different between them. And that this is due to the history of genetic selection for food score. Australia started implementing the genetic selection like a program, an official program for evaluation for food score earlier than in United States. When we look at the data, we have records of a food score like uh, five years um, uh, before when uh, United States actually started officially recording for it. So I think um, I think I, I think I would stay with my statement that they are uh, they are similar enough to be considered as the same population. But of course, in terms of um, the selection history, the official genetic history for food score differ a little bit between the two countries, and that these could be seen, I think, in the variance components. Does that answer your question? Would you agree? Yeah. With uh -huh. I, I do agree with you for sure. I agree with you, and I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't want to dispute dispute what you say. I'm just thinking in terms when I teach. Uh -huh. I always say to students that you have to estimate uh, these variance components because the populations are different. But then it comes back to what's the definition really of a population, mm -hmm. right? So all of these different components, I I would throw them all in the same basket as well. That's that's not the question at all. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. on a more definition level, yeah. I guess. How do how do we consider populations in that and that sort of thing? But excellent answer, excellent uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you too. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, I, I think I have a question. Can you see Amanda, uh, my image or is it? Um, um, no, actually, can I stop um, the, the presentation? Sharing, yeah, yeah. sure. Huh? We need to be, yeah, so, jump back. Yeah, okay. So uh, my question is related to the conclusion of your second study, and I'm always interested in Jibai. And so uh, I really liked to, think about the idea of when you have the genomic information, you actually improve also to uh, your study when you are considering a genotype by environment interaction. But then uh, what you showed, you still had a uh, genetic correlation below what is so often used as its cutoff. And so I was wondering, as you learned all this and studied, uh, so, what would be the recommendation in terms of studying GBAE as you then talked about some artifacts and some reasons for uh, having a genetic relation below 0.8 and then um, to moving on and saying it's best to work with the two countries together. Uh, could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, that is a, a very tricky question that usually I ask everyone that works with uh, genotype by environment interaction to and across country. So um, 
I, I think like in my case, my conclusion was draw not like just based on the variance components. As I, again, I think I, I tried, uh, we try actually, it wasn't just myself, to draw a general conclusions based on a different level, such as the population uh, stratification, the variance components, but also, and more importantly, the genomic prediction. So when we look at the predictive ability of a model accounting for genotype by environment interaction versus a model that consider that the correlation equal to one, so we fit them as the same trait, the predictive ability, as I shown, it was similar, right? It was the same. So this was the first like conclusion draw. Accounting and a non-accounting for genotype by environment interaction in that case provided the same predictive ability. And the second point that we look also were, okay, if I'm using the model using genotype by environment interaction, and if I select the top 100 sires versus the model that we used, not accounting for that and selecting the top 100 sires, how they overlap between them. So in my case, uh, there were a high overlap between those sires. So the conclusion, I, I think, I cannot draw, um, in my understanding, I cannot draw um, agnostic conclusion for, for this case. In my population, in, my in the population that I was working with and in my data set, that was the case, that the using accounting for GBI and a non-accounting didn't change the prediction and neither didn't alter so much the ranking of individuals. So yeah, I think that this is a point that has to be evaluated by population to population, even within the same population for different traits, because I don't think that is agnostic like conclusion. It is so population trait specific. Yeah, so I would recommend comparing models and comparing the predictive ability and also the re-ranking of sires. Does that answer the question? I didn't give you like yes. a true question. No, yes. That was, that was uh, what I was thinking of, but of course you, you implemented very well and I'm learning as well. So uh, it's very welcome to hear different approaches and how we need to be aware that actually we have different ways to 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 make up a conclusion, not just looking at one single uh, situation. Thank you very much. Thank and now we have uh, hands up here, so please uh, gather. I think that's how it is. Please go uh, ahead. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Matilda, for the presentation. It was really interesting. Just uh, out of curiosity, do you have frequency distribution for the scores? Did you check the frequency distribution? Just I was wondering how normal it is, or do we have any animal with the score number one or either nine? These are some to the curiosity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, that is a very good point. Um, so the distribution when we look from score one to score nine, we have a very low frequency of a score from one through four very low and actually that was interesting because it is not just in us and australia data set but also in red angus there was a study that they have a very low frequency this is one of the reasons why we use just records from five through nine to have a better representation so and when we look compare between us and australia the score distribution and are now talking about from five through nine we see a different distribution of the records too. So we are going to see that in US, the majority of the records, the high frequency, it is at five, while in Australia is at six. And like one justification that we thought was regarding US farmer recorded versus in Australia would be the technician. Um, and in terms of normality, we know that our trait, it is a categorical trait. But uh, in terms of analytical point of view, we tested using a threshold model and using a linear model. And honestly, we didn't see difference. So um, at the end, after many tests, actually, we decided to keep up considering that our trait for, uh, follows a normal distribution and using a linear model because 
uh, again, we are thinking about a weekly genetic evaluation and when we compare the drawbacks of a threshold model uh, with the linear model, it is much better to use a linear model, right? The, does that answer the question? Yeah, the, the, the follow-up question would be, given that there are very low number of the animals to score below, so that do you think that industry may need to redefine this scoring system or yeah that is a really good question that i i'm not going to be brave enough to answer to be honest um these we had actually questions um throughout throughout this project about this the one through four and the one question that we had was is one through four score actually the same trait of this the five through not the six through nine because if you look like phenotypically they are different right so yeah um yeah i think this question i think uh, i wouldn't be brave enough to to answer but i, I know that american angus association and angus australia they have that in mind and they were uh, thinking through um like this scoring system mm -hmm. thank you i appreciate it thank you Okay, Tatiana, please go ahead. Oh, hello, Tati, I cannot hear you. Yeah, because I was mute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. For you. Uh -huh. <laughs> really nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is more related with your first topic. Because behavior is a trait that I'm fascinated about, because there are many effects involved in that. And I can imagine that the animals are like us. One day we wake up and we are in a good mood, other day wake up and we are sad or mad. And I was curious to see your scores. Most of our animals, they are, I can say, calm, mm -hmm. like from one to three, right? So uh -huh. then you have like, low frequency of the animals from four to, to six. Yes. My question is, do you think this is because of data collection or there are any indirect selection for calmness in Angus? Because I was thinking if you do the same study in Elori, for example, probably you're going to see more towards to the aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if it's data collection because it's just a subjective trait mm -hmm. or is due to selection pressure or indirect selection for certain traits. Yeah, I, I, I think that it, it probably has many layers into that scoring, of course, can it be biased on the selection and that this is one approach that we try to do it is to um, um, remove contemporary groups that doesn't have a variation on that contemporary group because there are some when we get the raw data like in the raw data we have like over 600 phenotypes and if you take a look on, on how much drop like from the raw data set to my actual data set and the majority of those records I removed because there was no variation within the contemporary group either everyone was one so I think that probably there is some level of general, uh, of bias on the scoring, but of course can also be um, there uh, the official genetic evaluation for temperament is not like as old as for um, weight, but indirectly phenotypically farmers has been like selecting for temperament over many years. So I think that it can be both sides, but again, a selection is not made just based on one trait, right? It is based on a much more, it is like a complex selection. It is a selection based on multiple traits. In our data set, we can clearly see that there are many individuals that they are very ag aggressive like many daughters that were very aggressive. And this is just because they come from a very good bull. That bull, it is known to be very aggressive too, but has good production. So I think um, this skewed distribution towards um, um, more docile scoring can be like 
due to many reasons. Uh, bias, recording, being a subjective measurement. Maybe if we had like a, a more objective measurement, probably we would see more variation, right? Yeah, but you did an excellent point. Yeah, I think um, th there are good parts of like a subjective measurement because we are getting a lot of data and we can properly it or hopefully properly estimate like um heritability etc but of course in the future i think it is always good that you look into other perspectives or more objective measurements mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i agree with you and there is we can see in other species that if you put a lot of pressure on production traits Indirectly, you are selected for more aggressive in the animals. Oh, yeah. Okay. oh yeah, that's good that you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question. Okay, thank you. Great presentation again. Thank and you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. All right, Amanda, I think uh, our time is good and once again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for sharing with us all this work that you've done doing your PhD. And now uh, looking forward to in the future hear more from you and, and your work with plants now, not animals, <laughs> but it's still yes. working with genetics, right? That's mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you very much. And for you in the audience, thank you again for joining us. And I hope to see you all next Friday. So next Friday you will be in person, but we'll still be um, streaming online. And yeah, I hope to have you again with us. Yeah, thank you all for attending, and thank you Ivan for the invitation and hosting me. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.